good morning. Okay. Let's try that again. That was very weak. Good morning. Okay, that was a little better, but not great. But we're going to let it slide today. I know it's hot outside, so yeah, we probably are losing a little energy. I want to take a moment and thank you for coming today. I'll let you know we have a good service planned. The children sang in the first service, and they did a wonderful job. The children's choir uh, continues to amaze me how good they are and how uh, precious their voices are and just how much I get out of it, having the opportunity to lead them. I get more out of it than they do, so it's something that I look forward to each and every week when we work with them. And incidentally, if you could hear them pray, wow, is that not amazing? So I'm glad that you're here, certainly I'm glad that you're taking time to come. From the book of James, the first chapter. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. That's the key right there. And we're going to revisit this scripture before prayer. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Let me ask you, we've come to worship. Have you come to worship? Do you believe you're going to worship Jesus Christ today? Do you believe you're going to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe the hymns we sing are going to be worth it? Do you believe the prayer that you're going to hear, the, the, the sermons that you're going to hear? Are they going to make you closer to Jesus Christ? That's what we're here for. I want to challenge you with this. If you don't believe that, pray right now. Pray right where you are to say, God, help me. Open my heart. Help me to have the best service that I can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. For the next hour, Father, may our hearts and minds be open. May we feel the presence of the Spirit, Father. And when we leave, I pray that you will have received glory. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us begin worship.
take a moment. If you're visiting with us today, we want to let you know how glad we are that you've taken time to come. We know there's a lot of opportunities at other churches. We're glad you've taken time to come and visit us. If you have any questions at the end of the service, you can see me or see Don. We'll be glad to help you in questions that you may have. And certainly, again, thank you for coming. Rejoice in the Lord always from the book of Philippians. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's all stand and we'll begin with this course. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. One more time. should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. So as we sing these two songs, choruses that we do, we do this as we lead up to prayer. We want our prayer time to be very effective. We want our prayer time to be very meaningful. 
But even as we, and I'm included, as we sit back and listen, we're still vessels to speak to God. If we really don't believe that these prayers are going to do any good, that's a problem. Why well, pray? If you could hear the children on Wednesday nights pray, it is the purest. We stand in a circle and we hold hands. And as we as adults pray and we search for big words or whatever, their prayers are so simple, right to the point, and they move me so much more than any adult. They're pure. And they reach out and they speak directly to God. And it is a it is a pleasure and an honor to be a part of that. I would video it, but I'm afraid it might take away from it to let you see it. I want you to know they understand how to talk to God. They have no problem opening up their heart. They're not confused. They're not into all the worldly things. They're not worried about what they're going to do at work or whatever. They're just there and they want to talk to Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible talks about a childlike faith. And we all need that childlike faith. As we sing these two songs and then go to prayer, may we have more of that childlike faith. May we truly believe that when dawn comes, God's going to hear this. He's going to make a difference. And if you don't think that, we need to work on that, all of us. We've got to get to the point to where we have a straight, open mind that is uh, not cluttered with the worldly things, and it can talk right to God. So our two choruses or song, we'll have a hymn, Heaven Came Down, and we'll go into the chorus, Give Thanks. I'll stand you up at some point for the prayer, but let's just start seated with 573. Right. 
Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given. So, Father, we're here. We want to acknowledge that you're the one who invites us to pray. You're the one who opened up a door. You tore the curtain uh, to make it plain that we didn't need anyone, that we could come into the holy place. Father, so this moment, not because I pray, but because we pray, because our hearts are drawn to you, our hope is in Christ alone. Uh, Father, bless our time. Thank you for these songs that we've already sung. Uh, we want you to be glorified uh, in each of us today. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Again, if you're visiting with us today, we want you to know that we celebrate communion each and every week. It's very simple. Each follower of Jesus Christ has a place and is welcome to participate at this table. Speaking of at this table, come to the table in number 406. You can have my copy. It blew away. Here you go. Take this. Yeah. I just hope I remember it. I think I do. <laughs> Dream. 
I think it's safe to say that everyone in this room is continually learning of the meaning of the cross, the significance that it has in each of our lives. I know that is true for myself. And so may you and I know of his love. May we be convinced of it. May we enjoy it. And then may we give it like he does. We give thanks. blood of Jesus washes away our sin. We give thanks.
worship and to praise you and thank you, Lord, for this time of offering and gifts that's been given, Lord, to keep our church going and to keep our ministries going. And we thank you, sir, for it. We ask you to bless the gift and the giver. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. And we have to have Pastor Don this morning to give and anoint him with the words that you give to you. Thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. even to the passage that we're going to be looking at, how that God intends to change lives. I'll say that again, how God intends to change lives. Good morning. Um, Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Lana Jackson, we're members here, and I stand here today feeling very blessed to share with you my journey to accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Um, you see, as a child, my grandmother was the one that took me to church. Every Sunday morning, third pew, middle of the row, every Sunday morning. Um, she was a godly, spunky, very um, religious, influential lady in my life. But for my immediate family, I grew up in a very loud, boisterous, fun-loving family. But it was all about business. My dad was a businessman, and he had several businesses. You name it, he had that. But the thing about some of those businesses, they were not a good environment for a young lady to grow up in. 
He had bars and he had restaurants and hotels and things like that. And I was exposed to a lot of things that I could have gone in many, many directions in my life. But you know what? God was there with me and I didn't know it. Um, when I was just one month past my 17th birthday, I got married to a PK. Do y'all know what a PK is? It's a preacher's kid. And so, <laughs> they're the worst. <laughs> no, really, we married, and um, his family was so, so different from mine. They were so conservative, so religious. And um, the two worlds collided, and uh, we, uh, we raised two children, and... Um, you know, of course, who took them to church? Grandparents. Just like my grandmother took me. The cycle still, still came on. So finally, as we were married several years, it just felt empty. And uh, I didn't know what that emptiness was really all about. It just felt like a void was there. Now I look back on it and I know it was God. We had just neglected God, ignored God. And uh, so as we went along the years and everything, uh, I was a working mother and a PTA mother, a, a sports mom, etc. during the week. But Saturday nights were just for me. And I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but that's when I found out that I needed to fill the void on Saturday night instead of Sunday morning. Right. And it wasn't a good, it wasn't something good. It was uh, clubs and dancing and alcohol. Um, and I still, I was, I was searching. And after so many mar uh, years of marriages, 19 years, I kept wondering, was this void real or was it something I imagined? And, uh, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't deny it. So, uh, the marriage ended after 19 years, and um, uh, something kept nagging at me. I needed peace, and I didn't know what, how to do it or what I needed. And somewhere, out, out of somewhere came that I felt like I needed to read the Bible. And um, every night after my divorce, I would lay and read the Bible. And uh, I, I know now that was God drawing me nearer to him. Um, I was ignorant. I didn't know. I didn't know what I needed at the time. Well, as I was reading that Bible every night, God sent someone into my life, and he led me to the Lord. And uh, by the way, we ended up getting married, and he's my wonderful, faithful husband, Perry. And uh, as I look back and I reflect on my journey, I can see the godly influences in my life from an influential grandmother to being involved in a very uh, Christ-like family through marriage. And then God sending me my husband he was always there, even though I was ignoring him. Um, um, I have experienced the loss of a child, almost losing my daughter, divorce, fractured family ties, blended families, addiction within my family, and that's not unlike many of you. I, know, I realize that. Right. I'm just so thankful that I have God to lean on in those times. But you can also have God to lean on as well. I believe we all go through things in life, trials, and we are to help others that go through those same trials with what we've been through ourselves. But I'm standing here today 
as a testimony to what God has done in my life and how he was there for it all for me. He's there for you as well. Just open your heart to him and he'll, he, he never leaves you. Just be willing and have an open heart. Um, by footnote, my, my parents were both baptized and saved in their late 70s, wow. after all. Um, and through, through someone coming into my life and leading me to the Lord, that led wow. generations of my family to be led. So don't ever, ever underestimate the power that God has in what he can do in your life. I thank y'all so much for letting me share today. God bless you. Right on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lena. It means a lot. Thank you. God provides everything we need for the journey. He provides everything that we need for the journey. You stop and think about the Israelites, uh, which we're going to be reading a little bit about. God gave them the prophets. God gave them the temple. God gave them the scriptures. And... God provides everything we need for the journey. And so I want to read this passage with you here in 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to notice at least three things that are here. One is that God provided for the children of Israel in their journey out of Egypt. So think about that one for a moment. He provided everything they needed in that journey, in that desert journey he provided. It was there. Secondly, what we notice in the passage is their response. Their response was one that they tended to take what they learned in Egypt and they brought it with them. And they continued to do many of those same things. But then God comes back and he says to us, I'm providing for you the ability to live differently. Notice chapter 10, verse 1, 13 verses. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses. In other words, they were identified with Moses. In the cloud, and in the sea. All ate the spiritual food, the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after the evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Let us, com let us, nor let us, excuse me, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained. And were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written 
for our instruction or our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now, here's what God does. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except as is such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So let me give you two thoughts uh, right away. One, it's a shame when people try to simply dismiss the Old Testament. To dismiss it. There are preachers today who say we need to detach, unhitch from the Old Testament. This is one of several passages in the scripture that teach us to look back and see Number two truth that I want you to notice, and that is that God doesn't just give us a way to live, but he helps us. I would say to you that the Christian life is impossible to live. I'll say that again. I think that it's impossible to live on our own. Paul put it this way. He said, in Philippians 3, 3, he said, We are they who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And so that is what I certainly want you to walk away with. But I've got a principle that I'm going to share with you. And, uh, and, I'll, and my time's going to be fine. I'll be through in plenty of time. But let me just say this, that uh, God has given us a different way for us to live. He's made every provision for us. I want you to notice um, uh, this thought, if you're ready for it. I'm going to share this thought with you that I think is very important. You see, you and I are on a journey. Sometimes we get lost and sometimes we get off of the journey. Probably all of us do. I know that I have at different times in my heart and in my mind. But God is faithful. And he keeps drawing us back. He keeps bringing us back. And he will not let go of us. So the first principle, and I've got two thoughts here that are going to follow each other. You see, you and I spend our lives developing a faith that trusts that his work on the cross was sufficient for salvation. You see, it's really easy for you and I to get in this mentality. We go through our day, our week, our year. We look back and we go, man, I just really, really messed up. I really didn't do right this week. Or I really thought wrong. Or I, and, we, and we think that and we just really have this wonder if somehow that God still loves me. And I want you to understand, I want, to, I, want you to, I want you to grab this truth, because this is a truth that, that God wants us to hang on to the rest of our lives. And that is that as we develop our faith, we come to a place where we're trusting that His work that He did was sufficient. Not my work. His work. That was sufficient for my salvation. So he completed it when he said it is finished. That somehow when God became a man. When God became a man. And he lived here as God and as man. And he took 
as a man, he took our sin upon him. And as God, he was able to, to live a life that was perfect. And he chose the things that were right. And he obeyed all of God's commands, all of them. And so the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 that he became sin for us. And that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And so, God in this journey is teaching us that we don't have to trust in ourselves. But we trust in that work, that one work, that one thing that happened 2,000 years ago. We believe that He died for our sins. If you'll bring up those four points, and I'll be able to finish my uh, thank you very much. Uh, don't worry, it's not going to take us very long. But it goes like this. God's kindness is beyond understanding because it is not based on our goodness. I don't know about you, but that's a really good relationship when you love somebody and it has nothing to do with you trying to earn their favor. We've all been in relationships where we constantly tried to, to earn favor with somebody, you felt that responsibility to earn the favor, and yet we have a God who, who came when we didn't ask for Him. The Bible says in Romans 10 that He came to those who didn't ask for Him. He came to those who didn't ask for him. And so we've got that kind of a God who came to us. And what that faith does is, it, it is as, we go, as we go through our journey, our faith is constantly relying upon a love that is absolutely perfect. But I want you to know that there's that faith also does something else. That faith, what it does, that same faith, develops within us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. All of a sudden we find ourselves wanting to do what's right. And it's not for, it's not for image. It's not for, so that we can have some kind of status. It's an inner drive. And it happens to be God who's working within us to live differently. You see, wasn't that what God was trying to do with the, with the, with the, with the children of Israel? As you read in Exodus and in Numbers, you read those stories, even in Deuteronomy, you read these stories, God is constantly trying to bring them back. Constantly trying to, to work in them so they would do right, not just on the outside, but on the inside. Because God is far more concerned about your heart than he is anything else. And so I'm going to say this again. So here's the kind of God we have. We spend our lives figuring out and learning. Because I believe that those disciples, as they sat there that night with Jesus, and he was teaching them about this is my body and this is my blood, was just the beginning for them. They, were, they, they, they certainly didn't understand everything that was going to take place because they weren't even prepared for him to die. But they began to learn. And learn. Paul learned it in such a way that he, really, he came to realize that that death was such that an example that he was to die to himself as well. Wow. What a new, life-changing way to live. Where I don't live for myself. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says that Christ Jesus died and he rose again so that we would no longer live for ourselves. But for him who died and rose again. 
But the things that they displayed, even though God was providing spiritual drink, God was providing spiritual food, it was all there. But what did they do? They, they committed many sins. They were worshiping idols when God was the one. In fact, in Jeremiah, it says, you guys, he says, you guys were worshiping idols that have bowls that have holes in them. <laughs> you know, there's nothing there. They were worshiping idols. They were committing fornication and immorality. They were tempting God. They were just kind of throwing out things. Well, God, why did you do this? And you know, why did you do that? And uh, where is our water? And where is our food? And they became, be, became arrogant, even. Moses, we at least had onions and stuff when we were back in Egypt. We need to go back. Did you bring us out here to die? And they complained. Complained. And so, I'll be honest with you, it kind of reminds us of us a little bit, doesn't it? Does it not? I mean, sometimes we love stuff more than God. Isn't that an idol, maybe? We complain. We find ourselves, you know, uh, uh, you know in sexual immorality. We find ourselves loving something more than God. Sometimes we just complain to God about stuff. Is that true? So we've got a, God's, a God who is kind beyond understanding because it's not based on your goodness. Now watch this. Our hearts are almost always exposed when God interrupts our life. All of a sudden, their lives, they were, by the way, I just think that it's just a, just a side note. People really ought to think for a moment. God actually let Israel be in bondage for 400 years. They were, they were slaves. And they had it hard. So you let them do it. You let them be there. Just a thought. Well, then he rescued them. God's intention is for you and I to not be in bondage to anything doesn't want us to be. Now watch this. He does not want you to be in bondage. But here's the cool thing. There is no temptation but such as common to man. God will make a way. A God who says, yeah, I don't want you to do this. And yes, I do want you to do this. But I'm going to help you to do both. I don't want you to do that. But yes, I do want you to do that. I want you to be really good at loving people. I want you to be really good about that. I want you to be really good at it. And I'm going to help you. You see? Isn't that amazing to you? It's amazing to me. Number three. When we forget whose presence we are in and how easily we can alter God's best for our lives. <laughs> Isn't that true? Decisions made. Oh my gosh. And all of a sudden our lives became, became better. Maybe worse. Just by the decisions we made. By the things we said. But I want you to understand this, when I looked at that passage in verse 13, there is no temptation but such is common to man. He will make a way to escape. Did you, I don't know, I just was looking at that and I thought, wow, two things. One is he's always present. Two, he can orchestrate stuff right then and there. <laughs> God can orchestrate stuff right then and there. And it says... He will make a way for you. He will make a way for you. Isn't that fantastic? A God like that? Oh my. Fourth, humility is rewarded with a strength over every temptation that is meant to take us out. Let me just say this in closing. I'm going to try to close. I'm trying. Uh, He who thinks he stands, take heed, lest you fall. In other words, don't, don't walk through life and think, I got this. Don't think, I no big deal, I, I would never do that. Mm -mm. No, 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 back up. 
Take a step back and say, God, I need you to help me. You see, God doesn't want us to stand on our own strength. Just here. Last is that if Satan, which Ephesians 6 says that Satan is, a, is throwing darts at you, he's trying to bring you away, he's trying to take you away from God so that God is not your authority. Whatever he can do to take you away from God being your authority, being your best friend, he wants to take it away. Now I doesn't want to do that to you because once he does that to you he's going to take other people with you. He's going to take other people with you. Because other people are going to be influenced by the direction that you go with all your heart. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for interrupting Thank you for that. Father, I'm asking you to minister to every person in this room, regardless of where they are, regardless of whatever is in their heart right now, that you would rescue us from ourselves. We love you, and we need you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Stand with me, please, would you? Hey, if the Lord's spoken to you, you say, Don, I, I, I need Jesus. I, that's all I know. Is I need Jesus. I want this kind of love. I want this kind of health in my life. If God's spoken to you, you come. I'd love to pray with you. Would you come? We sing together. You know, Don said there's uh, almost an, an impossibility of, of serving God without Jesus. In, in John 14, 6, he simply says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father lest they come through me. There is no way to be a Christian without Jesus Christ. Hymn number 509, my faith looks up to thee. Because of a brand new grandchild, I guess. But she is moving up there uh, to be with her daughter and family and a brand spanking new granddaughter. So next Saturday, there's going to be a reception at actually Kathy Gibson's house. It's going to be from 2 to 4 next Saturday. And there'll be more information that will come out in a caller about exactly where Kathy lives. Okay? So... August the 12th, next Saturday, for Gina Winchester. What did you know about that? Thank you, Don. Along those same lines, Gina, yeah. I'm a very supportive member of the choir. Certainly a great choir member to have. Always present. Has always been very faithful. And so she will certainly be missed from our music ministry. Anything else needs to be mentioned today? All right, well, good. That means we got everything in order, and that's the way we like it. So, again, thanks for coming. Certainly glad you visited with us. And hope that you have a good week. Looks like it's going to be a little bit cooler.
and I am looking forward to the fall. I don't know about y'all, but I'm looking forward to it. Steve, if you would, please take us home. Dear Father, we thank you for all your lessons. We thank you for the pastor's sermon and beautiful music we've heard today. Help us understand we are imperfect humans and that we will fall and we will be frail during our lifetime. But help us to understand and search for that inner drive and righteousness that we all would like to seek to have. Bless us this week. Bring us back next Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.